here at the museum. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Restrooms are located to your left, <laughs> beyond the glass wall. Uh, exits are in the front of the museum, which are located behind you. And also you'll notice there are signs to your left and to your right in the back galleries. Before you leave today, please do pick up our seasonal program calendar. We have a free tour offered this Saturday at 2 o'clock. We are offering free guided tours on select Sundays, and we have lots of exciting programs coming up. Thank you for joining us for our panel discussion, Why Restore the Niagara Gorge. At this time, I'm going to welcome our moderator, Mark Gallo, Professor of Biology and Co-Chair of Sustainability here at Niagara University. Thank you, and enjoy. So my role here today is moderator, and as such, I'll try to be out of the way as much as possible and let the panelists do their job. But of course, Dr. Cliff knows me best, and the smiling already knows I'm always devil's advocate. So I'm going to actually throw a question out here at the beginning, and then we'll see how you can use it if you need to during the question and answer period, which will follow. So uh, let me start by uh, present the, discussing the presenters. So first off, we have uh, Thomas Hegler who is the individual whose artwork is, is on display at this point, and again, we'll discuss um, his reference for this area. Then we have Dr. William Cliff, a professor of biology at Niagara University, and uh, my friend, and uh, I guess covert in crime at times. <laughs> and uh, then we have Rachel Krasikowski, which I think I got it right that time, yes. right, Rachel? <laughs> is a community engagement um, for Western Europe Land Conservancy. Partners who are involved in a number of restoration and, and, and um, long-term care of some um, very precious properties in this area. And then we have Emily Sadowski, and I'll make sure I say it right because I don't have to put a dollar in the jar. It's um, from the Niagara uh, Waterkeeper, formerly known as Niagara uh, Riverkeeper. So um, that's our panel for today. And so what's going to happen is they'll need to give a small talk. I think they'll either sit or come up to this microphone, uh, give a five minute and then we'll leave plenty of time for question and answer afterwards. So as I said, I have to throw my own little question in here first, and that is, you know, why restore the Niagara River Gorge, which is again the starting point of this. And, and that's really an interesting question because maybe the first one should be, should we? And if so, to what? Do we play God? What about the major tickets course? And I like to use an example here. Dr. Cliff knows I'm a very visual learner. So we have two things here. They're not looking so nice at this point. But I have this, this pretty purple flower. And I have this other pretty purple flower. Both beautiful in their own right. But conservationists value this one much more than this one. Somehow this one is, has a very different value associated with it. This one is an aster. It's a native plant. It's a wild flower food source for a number of butterflies and other insects. It's something that we would like to see in an environment. It tells us something about the health and vitality of it. This one, knapweed, is an invasive. It can take over an area. It's, it has something that's known as allelopathic, that once it takes over an area, it actually spreads things through its roots to make chemical warfare with other plants so they won't come into the area as well. And so it actually takes over and becomes a, a, almost a monoculture of this particular plant. So I want us to at least put some things like that into our mind as to what is our role as stewards of the land? Do we control, be controlling? Do we allow nature to take its course? Or do we place some place in between? So I'm finished at this point. I'll turn it over now to our, our first presenter, Thomas Heckley. Yeah. 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 
necessity of thinking about these things in this fast-paced society. And I think a lot of our natural resources are kind of uh, put under the carpet. I think it's really important to bring them out. Um, so my approach is for an artistic or aesthetic sense, uh, while there are other people on the panel may approach it slightly differently. Um, and, and really what I'm doing is approaching this more or less from the sense of beauty. And I'd like to quote uh, and start uh, this off with a quote by Roger Scruton. He's an English philosopher, and he's done a lot of presentations on the whole world of beauty in our lives. And his, one of his quotes, uh, the sense of beauty puts a break upon destruction by representing its object as irreplaceable. When the world looks back at me with my eyes, as it does in an aesthetic experience, it is also addressing me in another way. And something is being revealed to me, and I am being made to stand still and absorb it. What is revealed to me in the experience of beauty is a fundamental truth about being, the truth that being is a gift and receiving is a task. So I think my work very much parallels a lot of his philosophical views on beauty, and that really with my work, that's exactly what I'm doing, is I'm pursuing the celebration of beauty and creation. Um, in many ways, beauty is a muse to me, whether it is a still life or a portrait or more uh, dominantly in the form of a landscape. Uh, I try to find the beauty in the common or looks, whether it's a fallen leaf or some moss, to the more dramatic and sublime, such as Niagara Falls. And in the end, I look at my work as a form of devotion or devotional prayer um, and celebrating that spiritual side of myself. And uh, I find myself in the studio, one of the first things I do every morning, and typically get up at 4 in the morning. Uh, that's my time to have my own time before my kids get up. And uh, I often start the day with uh, some readings or prayers, and it really sets the, the cadence and, uh, and the mood and the atmosphere for working with my paints. So my relationship with the Gorge, uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, early in my teens, I was often down there, and one of the things I was often doing was hiking and fishing. And I would hike down there with a fishing rod with a couple friends, and uh, it was a chance for us to, to chase salmon around. And there's something very special about looking into a salmon down in the Gorge, because not only fighting this immense uh, muscular fish, but uh, an immense current as well. And, and having said that, there's definitely this feeling of, of humility when you're down there. If you haven't uh, gone down there, there's something pretty special about standing on top of a boulder that's the size of a house and seeing these incredible currents go by and looking up at the cliffs. Um, it's really a really very humbling experience and uh, I think it really grounds you in humanity. But also while I was down there, I was acutely aware of the environmental issues that are going on around us. Um, you can smell the chemicals in the water and the air. Uh, you can see the discoloration of the water and the foaming that's happening, and also just the cotton litter. So it always left a bad taste in my mouth. And again, back to that purpose of this why I restore the gorge, and I think initially becoming aware of these issues. So it was about 20 years later, again, that was back in my teens. It probably wasn't 20 years later until I actually started revisiting again. And um, and it kind of correlated with the past 12 years as my pain cruise began to grow, and I was really focusing on local attractions as subjects for my work. And again, I was having this uh, this growth of faith and spirituality with within my work as well. And all that kind of culminated with my experience with the Hudson River Fellowship, and a little bit about that. So. Uh, a dominant artist named Jacob Collins, who's in New York City, who started this fellowship several years ago. And the whole focus of this was to mirror the approach of the Hudson River painters back in the 1800s. And the whole purpose of that would be to go into nature and to study it and gather information without a camera. So taking notes, drawings, and paintings, and eventually those would become your reference guides back in the studio to do larger paintings. So, the, the whole thing, I think, is kind of um, summarized a little bit by one of your stats quotes, because he was celebrating the American landscape, which is really what the Hudson River School was. It was an art movement where they were celebrating the, the natural phenomena of our, of our Americas. And what he said was, truly all is remarkable and a wellspring of amazement and wonder. Man is so fortunate to dwell in this American garden. And um, I just think it's a really nice uh, quote that brings things in. So about the Niagara Project, uh, so you mentioned that you've been taking the time to look at the show, and I appreciate that. I mean, I'll give you a little bit of a bad story on that. After I had gone through the Hudson River Fellowship, you know, I was asked by Jacob Collins to start teaching workshops, and I really got involved with that, and, and also trying, when doing these workshops, to create an awareness.
Paris. One of the things I always do with my fellow painters is I encourage them to walk out of the area with more than they walked in. In other words, if you see things on the ground, pick them up. And it's, it's one small thing we can't do when we're out there. But um, my intention, having gone through that, was to create an instructional video. And I started thinking about what would be a good subject for that. And as you know, a lot of Hudson River painters used to consider Niagara a mecca for going as a, a place to paint. And in my mind, I kind of dismissed it for a couple of reasons. One is I think just living so close to it, you take it for granted. Um, but two is I always had a bad taste in my mouth uh, because every time I would go there, I felt it was commercialized, and very overcrowded. So again, I kind of dismissed it. But after thinking about it a little bit longer, I decided that I would go back there and I would at least try doing some sketches. And I'm very happy I did because at that point I really started re-falling in love with, with the whole Niagara Gorge and Falls. Uh, it was an opportunity to actually walk in there and start drawing. And what I noticed is that the crowds and the commercialization completely dissolved. And you're really overtaken by the ions in the air, the smells, but more importantly, the incredible roar that you hear close up to the falls and, and, and feeling that power. So my experience with the Hudson River uh, Fellowship really gave me uh, a training in a painter's voice, and in the end it gave me visual language. And what it taught me to do was to really slow down and observe and study and understand, which is a very different approach than say the impressionists. One of the things that they tried to do was capture the moment relatively rapidly in what's called al prima. In al prima, typically a painting is done in one shot within a couple hours, while with the Hudson River approach, it's more of a study. Um, I remember at, at the fellowship, there was one gentleman I, I worked with fairly often. He worked on a single drawing that was this big, and he spent three weeks on that drawing, every day, from sunup to sundown, for three weeks. Never took a break. And that was kind of the whole purpose, is to, to walk away with this incredible understanding of what you're drawing through this observation. And in the end, really what I was trying to do was gather references. And the references, again, when I was working on a larger painting, they were actually hanging next to it, flanking it, so that any time I'm working on a particular area, I could easily take that reference and refer to it for whether it's color or drawing or any other information that I needed. So again, I was starting to understand this symbiosis of botanical and geological traits in the region, as well as the characteristics and the physics of the water, which are very, very important to be able to pull off this painting. And in the end, they were a huge preparation for this. So back to the original question, why restore the gorge? Uh, I think we are given this America, this amazing, beautiful area, and, and we're obligated to be stewards for it. And if you haven't done it already, once again, I invite you to consider taking a hike down there, take a backpack, maybe a lunch. Um, I would avoid bringing headphones and, and, and maybe just bring a camera. Um, and just slow down and experience this wonder. It, it's really a gift and it grounds you and gives you a sense of humility. Uh, also, you would probably quickly become aware of the environmental issues, um, but knowing that I'm very optimistic, I, I think that the first step to um, retaking something is just simply being aware of it. Uh, because again, I think it's important that we'll be able to hand this off to our children in the future, uh, because we do have this amazing sublime right in our backyards. And again, I would invite you to consider my art as a form of praise, awareness, and hope. And, uh, find that same connection. And I'm going to end on one more quote. And again, by Roger Scruton, beauty is an ultimate value, something that we pursue for its own sake, and for the pursuit of which no further reason need be given. Beauty should therefore be compared to truth and goodness, one member of a trio of ultimate values which justify our rational inclinations. Thank you very much.
And then Mark has asked this question and, and others, why restore the gorge? And I'm going to provide some reasons in light of what I would say are major approaches to environmental ethics in that issue. And then I'm going to ask a question of you and really the, the broader Niagara community. What should be the role of Niagara University in the restoration of the gorge? And I'm going to end by describing some examples of student involvement with regard to the gorge, particularly from an environmental perspective. So what is restoration? Well, there is a field called restoration ecology. You can see here by the definition from the society of what restoration is all involved. And I think the key here is it's assisting the recovery. We can think of restoration in many ways like healthcare to humans, right? Healthcare providers assist the recovery of a person that has been come ill. Now we have to ask the question really, how is it that this particular area, this particular region has become damaged or destroyed or degraded? And I'm gonna quote here from one of the assessments that was done uh, in the gorge for a comprehensive assessment. This is what they said. The two greatest threats to the rare plants and the natural communities of our gorge are human disturbance and the abduction of an alien invasive species. Mark has mentioned this. So keep that in mind. I think we'll perhaps address this in some of the other presentations. Human disturbance and the introduction of alien invasive species. So how do we go about the process of restoration? Now, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna cover it all, and I'm certainly not an expert in this area, but I think we're helped by an example from uh, Douglas Larson's group, his so-called the Cliff Ecology Research Group, named after the cliff biology that he works on for the University of Gulf. Well, excuse me. And this paper here is one that I'm going to reference, where they looked at a location near uh, the Canadian. Uh, So what do we 
meaning by ecocentric in terms of an approach to environmental ethics and certainly an approach to thinking about reasons for restoring the gorge. Well, ecocentric means that we are environment centered. It concerns ecological activity and the well being of those ecosystems. And it's, it's, it's typically associated with what's called intrinsic value of, of nature, of intrinsic value of ecosystem, that is, the values in itself. Now, I've identified some of these, and I don't think they're all of them, but I've certainly tried to identify some significant ones that we might consider. And again, I encourage our other speakers, perhaps, to add as well. And I've categorized them in two ways. One, what we might call ecological or environmental services, and the other is biodiversity. And I'm not suggesting they're entirely separate, but they certainly allow us to look carefully at these things. With regard to the services, we recognize that the Niagara River Corridor it is a major migratory bird flyway, uh, globally significant. Audubon has identified this as an important bird area. There are over 300 species of birds that use this corridor. There are a number of at-risk birds, and there are a number of birds which actually use the corridor as a major center of concentration. So it's a significant bird uh, environment. There are unique habitats, and I mentioned these, and I'll, I'll des describe these here, that are found within the gorge. One is called the calcare calcareous cliff community, and the other is called the talus slope woodland community. Now just to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, you can see those here in this diagram here. The cliff community is the rock face, and then the talus slope is that sloping face that has woodland. So that gives you an idea of what we're talking about. And these are been identified by a number of individuals as being neat communities within the gorge. We also recognize that for the lake sturgeon, both the lower river and the upper river have been identified as important spawning grounds. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the DEC have done that. And lastly, I, I, I think we should recognize that the river itself serves as an important water source for Lake Ontario. This was certainly brought home to us recently by what is now called the slimy black discharge that occurred earlier this summer. But I also have to recognize there are a number of, in history at least, and, and probably of current concern, toxic waste sites that have contributed to pollution of Lake Ontario, including a, a waste site here at the Booker Hyde Park, which is adjacent university, which is a major contributor, has been a major contributor, I should say, to the pollution of Lake Ontario. With regard to biodiversity, um, there are a number of rare, threatened, and endangered species that are present within the Niagara River Corridor, and particularly the Gorge. They include plants, uh, certain types of mussels, crayfish, fish, amphibians, and birds. And actually, it is something about the uniqueness of the gorge in terms of the waterfall misting, the wet seepage that occurs, the calcareous bedrock that produces, as I quote, one of the most diverse assemblages of rare plants within New York State. So it is a significant location for rare plants in that regard. And lastly, I'd like to mention these full growth northern white cedar. There are these trees within the gorge that could be up to 500 or more years old. Certainly, these of this age and greater have been found along the Niagara Escarpment, and the work of Bruce Kirshner uh, certainly highlighted this work in particular. Now, there are certainly other ecocentric reasons for uh, restoring the gorge, and I hope perhaps Emily or Rachel will be able to address those. I'd like to move on to talk about what we might call anthropocentric. Those, these are human-centered reasons. They concern human activity, human well-being, and they're associated with what we call the instrumental value of nature, or in this case, the gorge, instrumental in terms of their benefit to humans. And I'm really citing the work here of environmental ethicist James Justice when he identifies these types of sources of instrumental value. And I think we can recognize these. I'm not going to go through these in, in a lot of detail, but let me just tell a story. The story has to do with uh, my friend and longtime hiking partner, Chris Stenzel. We, like Tom, uh, enjoy using the Niagara Gorge for recreation, in, in particular for hiking. Uh, as he goes along with me, he learns about the gorge from me, a biologist. I learn about from him as a historian. We also find that there is psychological well-being that's associated with that. Studies have shown in a number of different ways that it, people's experience of nature helps to improve their cognitive capacities, emotional state, and also helps with their stress responsivity. So we're doing that as we're going through the gorge. Tom has alluded 
alluded to the idea of aesthetics, the idea that we, we, we have an experience of beauty, and I appreciated that quote. And lastly, there's a spiritual refreshment as well, and perhaps our, our panelists will continue to address those, those aspects. Moving on to the theocentric, and really this was Tom uh, who sort of inspired me to do this, because if you've read about his work, um, he makes biblical references in his work uh, to the inspiration behind his, uh, his art. In fact, he says, I have a quote of his, he says, I look at my paintings as devotional works that celebrate creation. So from the perspective of theocentric and the ethicists that take that, what are we talking about? This is a perspective that is God-centered. It concerns God's activity and God's concern for the well-being of creation. And in particular, we would say his concern for the gorge. And many of these ethicists will use this passage from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. As a central passage to understand and to, to start with with regard to our theocentric view. And so I would summarize that in the following way. God sees intrinsic and aesthetic value in his creation. So God saw everything that he had made and it was very good. And may the, the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. God takes joy in his works. Uh, he finds joy in it. And in many ways, I put this up here, this is some of the paintings from Tom, a picture of the artist there. We can think of God, perhaps, as an artist. He has crafted the falls, and the falls is a grand piece of his art. And so in light of that, if this is the way God views the created world, and particularly the gorge, how ought we to then approach the restoration of the gorge? So starting with those points, here is where I'm going to bring you. Meaning, we've talked about some egocentric reasons, we've talked about some anthropocentric reasons, we've talked about some theocentric reasons. Here's the question for you. What role should Niagara University play in helping restore the Niagara Gorge? And I address this to students in the audience, I address this to faculty in the audience, and any administrators as well. I'm not going to answer that question in the sense that it's a challenge for you in light of what we're going to hear as well and what we've already heard. Now let me close with a final overview of some ways that students have been involved in the past and will are continuing even today. Uh, Bill Edwards and a group of his students have, have led uh, a group of research that has gone into the gorge and looked at salamander populations. I believe Bill was redback salamanders. Yep, that Bill's in the audience back here. And we're looking at some population dynamics. Uh, and maybe Bill will, will be able to offer some more if people are interested. Bill's also taken students down to sample water quality, particularly in the lower river, and some aspects of the lower trophic level ecology as part of his classes. Um, I've been involved with uh, the Western Atlantic Conservancy at the Stella Niagara uh, Preserve, where we've taken students down in the last two years, and we're going out today, so I, I encourage you to, to come to us, where we make some very careful observations of the flora and fauna there at the Stella Preserve. Mark Gallows had students down in the lower river looking at aquatic um, biofilms, microbial communities on plastic substrates that he's, he's placed down there. And then lastly, a very comprehensive project involving an interdisciplinary group of faculty, including Jamie Carr and Paula Cott in English, Tom Chambers uh, in history, and myself, have been taking in an interdisciplinary sort of examination of the human experience of the falls as a natural wonder. So these are ways that students in the past and students now are getting involved. And obviously the question you're being asked, what further can we do? I'd like to close by just acknowledging a bunch of sources and others that have really influenced me in my thinking about the falls. These first four are a number of very good studies and reviews, including the water keepers in some of these that have discussed and, and examined the restoration of the falls. I'd particularly like to acknowledge Patricia Michael. She used to be at the Museum of Science. She's now at the Missouri Botanical Gardens. And her writings about Niagara Falls, the, the flora of the falls, are just tremendous. I can't help but acknowledge Bob Baxter and the Niagara Heritage Partnership because he really got me thinking, and that whole organization has got me thinking about preserving the falls. And then lastly, Mark and Bill and Cassie was back here in terms of our discussions with the, with, within the biology department. So thank you very much. I'd like to turn it over to our other speakers at this point. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Kraskowski. 
asking, I am the Community Engagement Director for the Western New York Land Conservancy, and we've been undertaking, um, just this past year, we started to undertake our three-year Restore the Gorge project in Niagara Gorge. Um, so who are we? We are a not-for-profit organization. Um, we work in all eight counties of Western New York, and we've been around since 1991, so we've been doing work here for almost three decades. Um, we're a membership organization supported by the community. We have almost a thousand members right now, which is really remarkable. There are a lot of people in Western New York, New York who care deeply about conservation and really value the places that are magical and incredible here for a number of reasons, including the, the gorge. Um, we've grown substantially in the last few years. We currently have eight full-time staff and three part-time staff. And the lovely picture here um, that you see is our office on the Kenny Glen Nature Preserve in Wales. Um, we protect all kinds of different places in Western New York, from forests to farmlands to meadows and wetlands. Um, but the Niagara Gorge is this opportunity for us to get involved in something that's, that's really the shining star of Western New York. Um, the project that we're working on is involved with a number of different um, organizations and agencies. Um, the project is led by the Land Conservancy, um, but the land is actually owned by the New York Power Authority and managed by parks, and um, we're working in the city of Niagara Falls, and we also have a number of consultants that are working with us um, to bring their expertise to the table as we approach something really big in the, in the Niagara Forge. Um, applied ecological services, landscapes of place, and the communities have all been really um, deeply involved in making sure that this project really does justice to the to Gorge. Um, it's a very, uh, it's been very well funded, um, first by the Greenway Ecological Standing Committee, um, and second by um, New York State's Buffalo William II. Um, one of the things that the governor said when he announced that he'd be funding this project is that the Niagara Gorge is the reason that Niagara Falls built up around it. So why not support the, e the ecological foundation that brought everyone to this place to begin with? So um, some of our prior panelists have touched on what's really remarkable about the gorge. Um, it is a place of incredible biodiversity. Um, there have been over 1,200 species of plants identified here. Um, and that's the vast majority of all of the plants that are found all throughout the entire Niagara frontier. Um, as Bill said, many of those plants are rare. Um, and he also mentioned that the entire Niagara River is a globally significant, important bird area. This is a designation that's shared with places like the Everglades and Yellowstone. So what happens here is so critical for global bird populations. It's not just a few birds that hang out here. It affects bird populations throughout the world. It's really quite a remarkable place. So we have a, a great duty to steward this place carefully. As you also know, um, the, the fresh water that flows through this area, it's 84% of our surface fresh water that's flowing through here. We all know what happens on the land. It absolutely affects what happens in the water. Another reason for us to really be responsible stewards of this place. And of course, the gorge provides breathtaking scenic beauty and serves as a source for a lot of, it's a big draw for international ecotourism for millions of people each year. So I'm sort of going to get back to basics about why we are doing this restoration here. Um, what's great about native species? Um, this was something that Bill touched on, uh, I'm sorry, Mark touched on when he gave our introduction. Um, the native plants that evolved in Western New York, they serve as a food source for all of our food chain. The insects that feed on these plants are specialists, most of them. Um, like the monarch butterfly you see here on the milkweed, its caterpillars can only digest and receive nutrients from the plants. And it's like this for almost all of the other insects that live here. And those insects are the foundation for our food web. So they feed our wildlife, the plants clean our water, and they support the pollinators that make sure that our food production continues. So it's really essential that native species aren't overtaken by introduced invasive species. Um, so this is just a, a photograph of some of the invasive species that are in the gorge. I believe this is still grass. 
Um, they outcompete our native species for space and light and food. Um, they don't have any real competitors, so they really do just sort of take over and choke out everything else, preying on native species. Um, the, the thing that um, Mark mentioned in the beginning about how they send out um, chemicals into the soil to change the composition of the soil, um, you know, a lot of invasive species do that. They make it an inhospitable place for the native plant species that our insects really depend on. Um, so it has the, the ability to really change our food webs and negatively impact the wildlife habitat and decrease biodiversity in this place where biodiversity is its, its main claim to fame. So we're undertaking a Restore the Gorge project, um, which will involve removing invasive species from the gorge and restoring those, those um, disturbed areas with native, locally sourced native plants. Um, we want to enhance the habitat here and restore the health of the ecosystem. We also want to have this, take this opportunity to reconnect people with the gorge and enhance the quality of life for the people who live here. And so we're working with the community closely to make sure that they're involved as we do this important work. So um, some of the ecological goals here to restore and enhance the ecosystem health and diversity. We're going to work to control non-native invasive species. Um, if anyone here has ever worked in invasive species removal, you know that it's not a one and done, yank it out and you're good to go kind of thing. Um, it's a long process that involves a lot of care and stewardship and careful control. Um, as I mentioned, we do use um, locally sourced plants and seeds wherever possible. We actually hired an ecologist who goes around to all of the properties the Land Conservancy protects in Western New York, which is over 6,000 acres of land, um, as well as some public spaces where we've got permission to collect seeds so that the plants that are restored to the gorge have a local, um, local genetic makeup, um, which is really important for timing of plants um, and the insects that rely on them um, you know, for the flowers to be available when the insects are, are out looking for it, that sort of thing. Um, and then we're going to find the areas where the rare, threatened, and endangered species are located and make sure that they are protected. Um, this slide shows on the right-hand side there a number of um, invasive species that are present in the gorge. You know, while we have this incredible diversity of plants in the gorge, they are being really attacked by these invasives. The Norway maple, um, you can see the little arrows pointing at some of them in the gorge. Um, the fragmites are just at the base of the cliff there. Um, and if let go, they will choke out everything else. They will create a huge canopy that prevents, um, prevents the understory from growing up. Um, they'll choke out any other um, species that can grow in that spot that provide a unique food source for the insects in the region. And as we remove those things, um, we can't just leave the soil disturbed. Disturbed soil actually promotes the expansion of invasive species. So we're going to, to go in and plant native species to help stabilize that soil and um, establish the plant community there as it, as it should be. Um, we'll use a, a wide variety of plants, including grasses, flowers, shrubs, and trees. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll be using locally sourced plant material. So we have two different project areas. Um, the first is um, the Discovery Center project. It goes from the Niagara Falls Railroad Bridge to the Discovery Center. It's about 33 acres. And we're also doing an Oak Savannah restoration area, um, which is between Finley Drive to Spring Street, and that's almost five acres, and that's also owned by Parks. So this is an area where um, we'll be doing a lot of additional herbaceous and woody plantings. Um, we have hired um, Daryl Morrison and Nancy Eaton, um, their company is called Landscapes of Place. We've been working with them um, at the Stella Niagara Preserve for the last couple of years. Um, they have worked in some really incredible places like the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens and Stone King Arts Center and the University of Wisconsin Arboretum. Um, so they're going to, to work on this um, design for the grassland here. Um, the really experts in ecological restoration will help us to restore what this um, Oak Savannah restoration will look like. Um, what you see on this slide is a little blurry. Um, there is our plan for the Stella Niagara Preserve. Um, the different colors represent different plant communities based on the soil conditions there. Um, that'll give people a really great experience of 
the different kinds of communities that you could find naturally in this place based on the type of soil that was there. This is a, just a photograph of what an oak savanna looks like. Um, great big um, sprawling um, oak trees with their branches spread out. It's about 30% canopy, so the sunlight gets down to the, to the floor of the, the savanna, and some of the great um, wildflowers and grasses are able to grow there. We're also working, as I mentioned, closely with the community. We've done a number of stakeholder meetings to talk to people about, um, well, to talk to our neighbors about what their concerns are. Um, one of the things that we like to think about is, you know, our work, we, we can't protect every piece of land, and we can't restore every community. But if each person in this room has some yard or garden or some place where they can make a difference in the health of the region's biodiversity. You can take out an invasive bush and put in something native and have an impact. And what we want to do is get our neighbors to think about that as well um, and to know that what they do in their front yard that's right across the street from the gorge can help contribute to the health of the region and what things not to do and what plants not to introduce because it'll threaten the work that we're doing there. So. Um, we're currently working on a public presentation meeting to invite the whole community out to, to learn more about the details. Our conservation project manager, Dave Spearing, who's been heading this project up, will be there talking about the work that we're doing in the board in a lot more detail. Um, I believe it's being scheduled for November 13th, um, but double check with us on that, um, and I'd be happy to get you the details if you're interested in coming to hear more about that. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's in the works. We want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to hear from us and to see what we're doing and to give their feedback, too. Um, we've also been doing a series of other events in the community, um, more than just sit down and meeting. We're taking people out to the gorge. Um, we have two excellent birders on our staff who um, took a group out to the gorge um, to do some bird watching. Um, we also had a um, geology expert come out and give a geology hike. And then on October 4th, we're having Sally Cunningham, who's a master gardener and is a TV plant lady. Um, and she's coming to speak at the Niagara Falls Library on October 4th in the evening. It's a free event, so please come out. Um, we're also doing a program with the Francis Center, so um, we can work with urban kids on a pollinator program. Um, all this information can be found on our website is listed right there. As I mentioned, it's a three-year project, so we've done most of the planning um, this year, and we started our community engagement, including the hikes and outreach meetings um, starting this year, but that's going to continue through the next few years. We'll have at least four public events or hikes each year for the next three years, um, and we'll be working on invasive species control and planting the natives um, starting this month and continuing forward to the end of the project. Um, the Oak Savanna restoration will start next spring, um, and then in December we will um, we'll check and make sure that we've hit all of our marks, achieved everything that we want to achieve, um, and hopefully the community will be pleased to see the progress that, that we've made in the gorge. So that's a, that's a, a brief summary of the Restore the Gorge project, but I, I definitely encourage all of you to reach out to us if you have more questions or if you want to get more involved. So that's it for me, and I'd be happy to uh, turn it around to Emily now.
documents um, that Bill mentioned already. Um, and so these really guide um, what Waterkeeper and other partners do um, in order to clean up the river. So um, the Greenway Habitat Conservation Strategy was one of the first projects I worked on when I got to Riverkeeper, well, what was Riverkeeper. And um, so we looked at what's the condition of our ecology, our ecological resources, where do we want to be, and how do we get there? Um, so we've been utilizing that to um, implement restoration projects. And so one of the major findings from most of these documents is that our shoreline and coastal resources are highly degraded. So we have lost over 95% of our coastal wetlands um, that existed here historically and also a lot of our shoreline resources. Um, over 80% of shorelines in the Upper Niagara River have been altered from their natural condition. So um, we're seeing the effects of this and degraded water quality and also loss of species that rely on these habitats for their life. Um, so we can see these are just a couple examples that show the degrading nature of our shorelines. And these do, they don't look natural. I mean, you can, you can tell by looking at the photos. So why do we care about our shorelines? Um, shorelines are some of the most ecologically productive places on Earth. If you've ever gone down to a creek or a river, um, you see a lot of little minnows swimming, a lot of tadpoles. It's where the frogs like to hang out, birds like to hang out. So um, it's easy to see that, that species rely on these habitats. So over 90% of our lake and river life um, relies on shoreline habitat for at least part of their life cycles. And um, natural shorelines also provide a lot of other great benefits. They help to improve water quality, they help to reduce flooding, um, they provide spawning habitat for fish, um, and also um, help us to access the water. So these are just a couple of figures that I like to show. Um, the reason we've lost a lot of our shoreline habitat is the way that we manage our shorelines. So we find that a lot of them are mowed to the edge, people like very clean lines, short turf grass, and that leaves the shoreline very vulnerable to erosion because the root systems of turf grass aren't any bigger than the actual grass itself. So when our shorelines start to erode, we like to, our solution is to slap on a wall, a concrete wall, a sheet metal wall, and that erases the function of the shoreline altogether. So if you're a turtle, you're not getting up to that shoreline. Um, also, it's pretty hard for vegetation to grow next to the wall if the, if the waves are bouncing off the wall, coming back. It's a very high energy environment. So that's what's happened to a lot of our shorelines. And so um, in response to that, we've developed a living shoreline program um, where we implement some restoration projects around the region to try and combat this problem. So I'm going to talk to you about um, a project we just completed at Hyde Park which is in the city of Niagara Falls. So not too far from the gorge, um, Gill Creek flows through the park and into the river just above the falls. So really the conditions of this creek do affect the conditions within the gorge. So these are just some historic photos of the park. It was a very, uh, it's always been a very important part of the community. Um, a lot of people we work with during this project had a lot of fond memories of this park growing up. And these are some of the conditions today. So it's really, it's really a great park. Pretty much any activity you want to do, you can do there. There's a skate park, um, there's an ice rink, there's a golf course. But the habitat and shoreline resources are somewhat lacking. So you can see the erosion that's occurring, um, which is affecting the water quality and also um, Last year they had a harmful algae bloom, so we thought this was the perfect place to implement one of our projects. Here's just some photos from during our restoration. Um, so here's a design overview. So as Tom does with his artwork, he intimately studies the flow of the water and how it moves through the ecosystem and the environment. So with our living shorelines projects, we do the same thing and we see what are the conditions there, um, what's degraded, what are the wildlife species that would be there, and how can we restore for them. Um, so the general design concepts are to use natural 
teaming with life, um, a lot of the bird species that weren't observed there before um, are using this area, so it's really exciting to see. And then I just want to talk a little bit about the human aspect. So um, these projects aren't successful if people don't use them and don't know about them. We want people to um, learn about the benefits of living shorelines and know that you can have a beautiful landscape um, with those same functions that you had before, but that is ecologically productive. Um, so we just wrapped this up last week with a press event, which was really successful. And our next project um, will be occurring at Stella Niagara within the gorge, so we're really excited to work with the Land Conservancy on that one. Um, a lot of the same design concepts for this and also incorporating that human aspect, so there'll be some informal kayak launch there. So why is this work important? I think I touched on most of these. Um, I just wanted to reiterate the fact that um, these projects increase community resiliency, so We've seen a lot more increased storms and flooding lately. Um, so it's important that we think more about our natural resources and how we take care of them in order to increase our resiliency for the future. So how can you get involved? Waterkeeper has a number of programs that the community can get involved in. We have a water quality monitoring program. We do yearly shoreline cleanups um, and a number of other programs, paddle tours, buggy tours. So you can visit our website to find out more about those. That's all I have.
but to do all we can as stewards of the land to make the habitat as viable as possible for all of the creatures that call the gorge home and to educate the people who are using it about what needs protecting and the ways that, that they can help restore ecology in their own way. I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's sort of how I think about it. I don't want to 
to jump into Valerie's question, which is Canadian and U.S. Uh, work in this regard. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I decided to work with Douglas Larson's group as well, because their work on that side of the gorge and that study was really, I think, pioneering and, and really reflects in many ways some of the issues that others are dealing with. I'd also refer you to Presidential Eccles uh, work, where she actually called for, and this is in the past, a binational effort, because we recognize, and I think we all recognize, the gorge is a boundary. And we share one side, and, and the kitty, you, you share the other. And so I think working toward a more cooperative effort would be in everyone's interest. Now, do I have a solution to that? No, but I would re reference you actually to her work. She was very insightful in thinking about how that might go forward. And I would support that in terms of the effort that she, she described. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in, but I want to call it. My name is Ed Torme. Uh, how will you or how have you put out the word to people in the community who want to support what you're doing with their with their time and with everything they have or can bring to them to whatever you're doing at the moment? Have you done that and have I just missed it or is there more to do in that respect? How will you, or how have you, put out the word to people in the community who want to support what you're doing, however you want to, you know, in, in a myriad of ways, I'm sure, but anyway, will you do that in the local newspapers, or is that how, how you have been doing yeah, it? I, uh, for the Restore the Gorge project that the Land Conservancy is working on, we have sent out press releases to the local news media, and have reached out to some of the, uh, some of the reporters who, um, who really seem to gravitate toward our work. Um, and they do a really wonderful job of um, covering the, the stuff that we're doing. Um, we also uh, have gone door to door. Um, what? I'm sorry. We've gone door to door in some of the communities, um, invited directly adjacent neighbors to come and meet with us. Um, we've mailed postcards. Um, we've hung stuff on people's doors. Um, so you, you, in, in the ways you're talking about right now, you could use some help. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and uh, we do have a, a wonderful group of dedicated volunteers who help us with this sort of stuff, um, and we are always looking for more willing and passionate fans to join us, so um, please do feel free to, to come up and talk to us after the panel. We would love to have more help if you're interested in playing a more direct role. Thank you very much. Thanks. And I would just add, uh, I think you bring up a good point, I think this Symposium, some other efforts, particularly Mark has been doing with regards to sustainability on campus. Bill Edwards certainly directing our environmental science program. We are wanting to get more of our students involved. So that's why I asked that question. And hopefully the students heard that and others as well. Now, what role can Niagara play as a community in that very thing? And then informing the community about that and what, what's going involved and how they can get involved. So I would say we're with you to to bring our students in connection with water keepers or land conservancy to be involved in their project. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, I am Gerald Schwerling. I'm a fellow of Niagara University. I want to uh, give some input. Uh, in other words, I, I would like to help perhaps with some contributions of the observations that I have observed since I was born and raised there, and you had a picture of Thunder Alley there. I remember as a 13-year-old boy or man that uh, those stones were covered with three feet of water. If you go down there and look at the trees, you'll notice that the trees are, are not older than 50 years old. That was uh, 49 years ago, 49, 50 years ago, when we used to crawl all over those slopes and the gorge, climb up the gorge. We had a lot of fun. And there were quite a few dogs and birds along the too. 
and I would say of any place in probably from here to Chicago and even further, uh, we'd have to look at Letchworth and some of those other places with waterfalls. But I had that information. And also the uh, salamanders. I own some property right down by the waterfalls. It's about 100 yards from the river, a quarter mile from the waterfalls, and I have been working on my own little microbiosphere, if that's what it's called. Although I probably have more invasive species than natural species, but I, I don't know the difference. But uh, every time I pick up a rock or this or that, I, I really protect myself. Pick them up carefully and take pictures of them and I put them back under the rocks. If you want to come out and check out my salamanders, I get quite a few. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to, uh, to offer any help. I'm also a New York State guide, so if you need anybody to take people on the trips through the, through the gorge and things like that, then I, I can be helpful in that. Thank you. That would be wonderful. If you want to come and talk to me at the end of uh, our panel here, I'd love to get your contact information and, um, and see what ways we might be able to collaborate. Well, thank you. And, and one last thing. When the Canadians planted the peregrine, when the Canadians planted the peregrine falcons on the face of the cliff on the right side of that uh, picture, they moved the fireworks about I'd say half a mile and more up the river. And that year, the next year, the population of those seagulls uh, rose by about 30%. I've got all that documented. I take the pictures. And since the bombs have been going off again, it's gone back down. I'd like to thank you for your comments. I, uh, I would also have echo uh, Rachel's comment after the with maybe we could speak. I'd love to have you perhaps participate with our class as we go out weekly to the areas. And, and, and also invite you, Rachel and I are going with our students down to Stella this afternoon. So if you have the opportunity, please join us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you to Castellani for making this available to us. Really, I appreciate it very much questions have been raised in my mind. This is not my question, but I want to pick up on it, a question about the media. Is there any media representatives here today? It's a good question. Does anyone want to reveal themselves? <laughs> okay. I don't see anyone raising a hand. If there was one, one media representative, that's good. Then go maybe to get two to the next session. Well, thank you for presenting this, but I think that's a very important point. How do we share this well as we can with other people and so on? Uh, one of my questions that I have not thought about before, but you're sharing your information, led me thinking about it. This whole thing is about restoring the glory. The word, the glory, what does it mean? Okay, the glory, is the river. It's the edge of the river. If you go down in the river to the edge of the river, walk along the gorge strand, that's it. Does the gorge also include at the top of the gorge? And if so, as far as all of your interests, someone, and your goals, how far back from the top edge of the gorge? 
species. It's a species plants and I don't I can't sure that I can describe it. Uh, maybe three or four feet tall. Right now it has blossoms on it which are yellow and I see fields of them and along some public areas you see them. Uh, does that mean mean anything to anybody? I haven't seen anything non-native like that, um, but I'm not an expert on invasive species. Most of what I'm seeing now are um, are goldenrods, um, which are a great native species, could great for pollinators. Could be what I'm talking about, goldenrod? It could be. Um, okay. They are definitely prominent this time of year. They're um, not invasive. It's not invasive. They're a great contributor to the local ecosystem. So there are some positive things. Yes. There are some others, and again, one is uh, Jerusalem artichoke, or sometimes called sunchoke, which will start to bloom over about now. It'll look like a small sunflower, if that's what you're, what you're seeing. And it's actually a wonderful source of food if any of you have ever eaten it. I think I've, I've convinced Bill to try it. Um, but you're right, some of the mowing practices have changed. Again, in the past, we always did it physically, manually, but now we've changed, in many cases, the chemicals. We use Roundup everywhere, and that process has changed what plants will survive, that kind of treatment. So you're right, there are some changes that I've noticed along roadways as well because of our, our management practices have changed using chemical instead of mechanical means to take care of plant life. So you're right, there are some changes that are obvious. I could also make another comment about your comment about the, the, the gorge rim. I think Larson's work would, would say this and others as well, that the rim is a critical area in terms of restoration. If we only work in the gorge, we are uh, working against an issue which is which is technically called seed rain. That is, the fact is, these plants at the top will rain seed down into the gorge. So unless you remediate that in terms of invasives and other non-desirable plants, you will constantly have this restored area being rained on by seeds. So I think you bring up a, a real important point. Again, I would, would direct you to some, some groups that have been looking into that and, and making proposals. Um, the Niagara Heritage Partnership, for many years, has wanted to remediate the so-called Robert Moses. And I think there's plans out there that are reasonable to do that in conjunction with uh, what's been proposed here by the Land Conservancy. So I would say it's, it is a problem or an issue beyond simply the gorge itself as you described. So thank you for bringing that up. And just one more comment, and then we'll, we'll take two more questions. But related to that, it's also this mosaicism, with, which even if we just define the gorge at any line, we have a problem where we need. It's a disconnect from everything beyond that. So we're losing that continuum to what we have as, as we feel, where we have you know open lands and, and other things like that in, in this community. So if we decide that we can define a, uh, an ecosystem by drawing boundaries, these artificial lines that we make, that's going to fail as well. And that's something that I think that reality is, is a hard one for any of us to stomach. And we know that, 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 it, that it is the reality that's out there. Uh, I don't mean to be a downer at this point, but I'm sorry I threw that out. But let's, let's do like two more questions, and then we'll, we'll, we, I'm sure the, the panelists would, would take individual if you want to walk up and speak with them. So are there two other questions that we'd like to hear? Scouring our shorelines and opening it up for uh, organisms to, to rehabit 
try to harness in nature's power. And, and as such, I think we, we've done a disservice. And, and I think that's something you would see through his artwork. Um, so I believe that region, the, most of the white cedars were a little bit further down the gorge. If, if you came, it's actually closer to Art Park. You, you'd find more of those, those old, old trees. So I'm not sure up in that region near the, the falls itself, how many of those are present. Any of the panels want to add to that, with the, with the cedars in particular? Yeah, I think that that region up toward the Whirlpool, um, Kirshner, when he did a lot of his work, was actually with the Niagara Glen, so he was identifying them there. So I think they're on both sides in that central region as well. But you bring up a, a good point about the effect of the water reduction flow. That certainly is an impact in a number of ways. I'll point to Tom's painting here and say, over on this uh, if you will, north side of Horseshoe Falls, at one time it was a very, mentioned this, very diverse plant community. Um, it is not as much anymore. It's been disturbed. There are ongoing disturbances there. This is an area of concern. I don't know the answer to your question. Has it anything to do with the lack of misting? That's a possibility, but I do know one that's relatively local, and that's Devil's Hole. Because, in particular, the remediation of Hooker Hyde Park, very less water gets into Devil's Hole through the ground because they're just sucking it back to, to, to purify it. And there's been suggestions that the ecology of Devil's Hole, in terms of the flora, has, that is and will be altered by that. It is drying out in that area, and we may see the appearance of a type of, of, of woodland and so on that is different from what it could have been if the natural water seeps would have continued. I don't know if I'm making myself clear here, but this plant over here, the Hooker Hyde Park, is literally drawing water from around it to keep those contaminants from flowing out. And one of those directions is toward the gorge. And therefore, there is less water in the, the Devil's Hole and that bloody run outflow than there was historically. So that may be an example that we could monitor or follow even uh, now and things like that. And I think we should end with something. Could I one more yes, question? sir. Yes. Thank you. Could anyone speak to the existence of the show called Elevator? Does that mean anything to anybody here? Show call elevator. It's a free elevator that takes you to the base where the um, ships are stored. So you can, if you've gone into the shaft and taken it down, it's a free elevator. Exactly. Yes. How many people are aware? For example, there are gorge trails along yes. the rim, not the rim, but along the river and so on. But for people who can't get down, importantly, get back up again. I was not aware until recently that very close to Niagara Falls, by the Niagara Discovery Center, right beside it, not very much information for somebody coming in. The elevator ride down and up is free. There's no charge, no restrictions on, just going to it and going down. You can take it around the base if you can't walk along the, you can get down at the base of the falls and see it. Wonderful resource. Not very well advertised. Thank you. Thank you everybody for your participation today. Thank you to the as well for their input. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. exhibition which is currently on display painting Niagara. I apologize the quality of this projector does not give this painting justice whatsoever. Please do see the actual piece uh, over here which is going to be on your right. If you have any questions let us know. Thank you so much. We hope to see you again soon. Have a wonderful day.